Detectives, what discovery will traumatize you for the rest of your life? I was previously a homicide detective, but the last case I did made me quit my job and I've been unable to sleep properly ever since. The case was a murder slash kidnapping. At least that's what it looked like and it was me and my detective partner Olson. There was a family of three, the Nebels, who had a beautiful six-year-old daughter. One of their neighbors had gone out for the paper around 6 a.m. and saw the Nebels front door wide open. When she went over to see if everything was okay, she saw the wife's body. The neighbor called 911 and eventually we were sent over there. Now, when I say there were no outward signs of a struggle, I mean it. There was no sign whatsoever that anything had happened, well, except for the dead body. But even her body, there were no wounds, no marks of any kind. This was already extremely unusual. Usually there would be some sign of how they died. On our way to the house, it came over the radio that the husband and daughter were unaccounted for. We didn't know where they were. We immediately assumed the husband did it, obviously. However, both the family cars were still in the garage, so we immediately assumed they would be on foot. Some officers canvassed the neighborhood and no one had seen them, including two neighbors that were on their porches for hours starting in the early morning. No one had heard any kind of commotion coming from their house either. Looking back at it, I now wish we had found them earlier. Maybe the case wouldn't have ended up so effed up. When we got to the wife's body, she didn't have a hair out of place. She was on her back in the kitchen. About a third of her upper body was under the table. We found out after the autopsy that, well, she just died. There was no cause that they could find. She'd been a perfectly healthy woman, didn't smoke, didn't drink, ate right, exercised. It was like she just blinked her eyes and gone from alive to dead. At this point, we still thought it had to be something to do with the husband, but the truth was so much worse. Extremely confused, we continued to search the house. We went through it with a fine-tooth comb, basement to attic, and found nothing. No evidence of a struggle, no weapon, nothing. So we left. We'd spent hours in that house thinking maybe we should come back in a day or two with some fresh eyes. We went over to where her husband, Benjamin, worked. He was a supervisor at a lumber yard. According to his co-workers, he'd shown up at work that morning just before 5 a.m. When he got into work, he started working on a narrow crate thing that he was building in his office. He told his co-workers that the crate thing was a project for his house. According to the other morning supervisor, he'd only built about half of the thing. Around 6.15, he said he was running to the bathroom, and that was the last anyone saw him. They never saw him leave. While we were at the lumber yard, I realized I'd left my notes at the house, so we drove back over. But when we walked in, something was so, so wrong. They had already started taking the wife's body away, but as soon as we walked in the house, we were hit by an unforgettable stench. It was, well, it was what a newly discovered but long dead body smells like. We knew it obviously couldn't have been the wife. We asked a few of the officers and forensics folks that were still at the house what the smell was, and they told us that it had only started a few minutes before we'd gotten back there. I'm not exaggerating when I say the smell was everywhere in the house. I've smelled some dead ones before, but this smelled like every wall in the place was lined with corpses. Pretty quickly, we found that the smell was strongest leading up to the attic. We'd already checked the attic, checking it myself probably five times at least, but we still went back up to check. I was up the little pull-down ladder first, and when I poked my head up, I saw something. I saw a piece of wood, like a box, you know, a crate. It was shaped kind of like a rifle case, maybe three feet tall, two feet wide, maybe six inches deep, rectangular. It was standing straight up, and there was blood leaking from it. We called the photographers and all the people in there. They all do their thing. And finally, they pull out all the nails and open the box. Out falls the husband. Think about that. This guy was maybe 5'10", 140 LBs, and he was put in a three foot by two foot by six inch crate. His bones were just a mess. His insides, all his organs were flattened. They were just wet, squishy pieces of fabric almost. He was just a rectangle of blood, skin, and parts. His skin had the discoloration of a body that had been dead for about two weeks, which obviously didn't make sense since they'd seen him at work that morning. He was also missing his eyeballs. We were standing there trying to rationalize the whole situation when something caught everyone's ears at the same time. A little girl's voice calling out for help. What followed was a sequence of all the people in the attic, on the lawn outside, inside the house, all saying some variation of the phrase, it sounds like it's coming from over there. Problem was, every single person swore they heard it coming from a different direction. Me? I heard it from right above me. No kidding. The first time I heard that little voice say, help me, I looked straight up, right up to the rafters. Of course she wasn't there. It was just my brain's response to where it perceived her voice as coming from. We had to listen to every one of these people tell us where they thought they heard her voice coming from. People swore up and down they heard it coming from the kitchen cabinets, the bedroom closets, the refrigerator, the tank behind the toilet, for God's sake. People on the street said they heard it from underneath cars, behind trees, on the sides of the houses next to the Nevels. Everyone heard her voice for about a minute and a half, two minutes tops, and then it just stopped. We should have taken this voice as a warning. About two weeks after that day, the wife's sister had a funeral for Jennifer. It went fine. They buried her all that. The husband's remains were cremated not long after that and put on display in a different part of the cemetery. I don't remember exactly when it happened, but at some point over the few weeks after he was cremated, someone stole his ashes. It was missing for about six months, and then one day we get a call. Find out a groundskeeper at the cemetery had called in. The wife had been dug up and posed like she was leaning against the grave, just relaxing. She had the ashes in her hands, but it was wrapped in skin. Well, they tested it, and it was the husband's skin. This whole situation was getting more and more effed up by the day. 
They'd pretty well reconstructed the man after he poured out the crate and he hadn't been missing any skin. And remember I told you his skin was discolored. Well, the skin was perfectly preserved and inside the urn, with his ashes, there were three eyeballs. Only one of them was the husband's. It's been 22 years and I still hear that girl's voice calling out sometimes. And I don't mean my memory or mind is playing tricks on me, it sounds so real. And then I remember it was May 12, 2007. I was going to pick up a pizza. I saw that girl, I saw Katie Needle. I don't mean I saw her grown up. I don't mean I saw a little girl that looked like her when she was young. I mean I saw that kid. She was standing outside the Walgreens right by our old house crying. I pulled over and got out of the car and I started to walk up to her. I can't explain how I felt in that moment. I was nauseous. I was so, so afraid, terrified, more than I've ever been. She looked right at me and said in that same voice, help me, please. I don't know what the hell happened, but she just disappeared. I never took my eyes off her. She was just there one second, gone the next. I thought I was losing my mind. I was seriously worried about my mental health. But then, about an hour after I got back home, the phone rang. It was Olson. Hadn't talked to him in five years, and he called me that night. Said he saw Katie Nebel sitting on a bus stop bench, crying. He lived on the other side of the country. He ended up ending his life the next day. There's never a good ending to these cases. That girl's voice still wakes me up in the middle of the night. Sometimes I hear it from downstairs, sometimes from the bathroom. But I think it's getting closer, and I don't know what to do.